polarization. It's a big word, but it's a word that we can understand. We can make sense of it. No, it's not dealing with the polar bears and nations, nor does polarization have anything to do with us ditching our Polaroid cameras because now we have smartphones. What is the idea behind polarization? Well, it's, it's a concept that actually comes from science itself. And it involves uh, light or radiation or magnetism moving in specific directions. From a scientific perspective, that's the idea behind polarization. I don't expect you to memorize that or, or tuck it away anywhere. But apart from science, polarization it deals with divisions between two sharply divided groups. And when polarization is present, when it actually kicks in, the differing views between uh, individuals emerge, and it can drive a wedge between people. Opinions and beliefs that uh, people have, oftentimes when they are polarized, are at opposite ends of the spectrum. They are saying the opposite things. They are really speaking past each other. I think it's safe to say that polarization identifies the day and age in which we live. Our country, especially politically, is perhaps more polarized than it has ever, ever been. Think about it. It's true. We are incredibly polarized when it comes uh, to the whole realm of uh, politics. And we notice that not only is there a lack of mutual understanding between Democrats and Republicans, but there is a lack of collaboration that takes place between these two groups. And if that is not enough, we discover that uh, members of both of these political parties are at odds with each other to the extent uh, where they increasingly have more and more negative ways of looking at each other. You can't help but feel it. You sense it in our culture, this animosity, this polarization. It's really a fitting word when we stop to think about what is happening in our day and age. The sad truth of the matter is that polarization has invaded the church. Of course, those within the family of God have always had disagreements with each other. That's nothing new. We know that there have been brothers and sisters in the Lord uh, who have schisms, they have divisions, they are at odds with, with one another, so much so that they have splintered relationships at times, and they have gone their separate ways. We know that. All sorts of uh, topics have caused believers to be pitted against each other. Beliefs about when Jesus is going to be coming back. Some hold to the imminent return of Christ. They believe that he will come back at any second. And there are others who will say, oh, I don't even believe in Jesus. And, and the idea that you believe in this pie in the sky information about Jesus coming back is, is ludicrous. And there are still polarizing conversations when it deals with what is actually going to be taking place next with the tribulation and the mark of the beast, and, and who the Antichrist happens to be. There are all sorts of discussions that can be extremely polarizing amongst believers. Christians also hotly debate issues, just like uh, people who are non-Christians in our society. You will find believers uh, who will be all over the map in terms of what they think about vaccinations. Should they get the poke or not? You have uh, believers also these uh, days who are involved in polarizing conversations. Uh, they, they hold to different beliefs about the economy and, and whether or not to invest in cryptocurrency. Or maybe uh, uh, gold or, or silver is the way to go. 
And then, of course, we know that uh, these days, and this is current, that there are believers who are debating whether or not to get involved with artificial intelligence, whether they ought to be accessing chat GPT, MidJourney, other uh, platforms that make available uh, the artificial intelligence, the AI that is available. Polarization, it's invaded the church. It is here. It doesn't take long before I hear of schisms and divisions that happen uh, outside the church and sometimes even within the church. A handful of years ago, during the pandemic, the elders had decided that we are going to be compliant with what the government was bringing down with executive orders for churches as well as other businesses to not meet in a building. And so we complied with what was being asked of us, and so we met outdoors. We had a drive-in church experience for a time. We also met on the wood chips uh, just outside there. And our goal was uh, to be compliant with the executive orders uh, to go along with Romans chapter 13, 1 Peter chapter 2, which tells us that we are to be in submission to the governing authorities. Not only were we endeavoring to be compliant with the governing authorities and with God's word, we also had you as a congregation at heart because we have some vulnerable senior adults who might have been even more susceptible uh, to uh, getting uh, COVID. And so our desire was to shepherd, not just spiritually, but physically, our church family. Well, during that time, um, I particularly and our elder board was getting some pushback. And there was one individual who was being rather insistent that uh, we ought to defy the government, we ought to open the doors of our, our church regardless. And when I was not in agreement, uh, this particular man took his hand, he ran up uh, my back and said, you need to develop more metal. The idea behind that, obviously, is that I don't have a spine, that I'm weak, that I'm not a man. Uh, that was a polarizing way of communicating. Now, I forgave this guy. I have moved forward. But I bring it to your attention to illustrate to you that as believers, we could be polarizing in how we communicate ourselves to others. Let's face it. Many professing believers have a polarizing way of communicating themselves. They got their dukes up. They're ready to get into it. They want to fight you. They have a polarizing personality. Beyond that, we also know that there are many professing believers within the family of God who are just hard to love. There are things about them that we don't appreciate. And our natural inclination, our tendency is that we want to, to stay clear of these people. We want to stay as far away from them as possible. But is that the Christ-like, godly thing to do? Is that the loving approach we ought to be taking? When it comes to loving believers within the family of God, I think all of us have our work cut out for us, don't you think? All of us who know and love the Lord, if the truth were known, have a ways to go in terms of how we go about loving our brothers and sisters in the Lord. Me included. I could be as guilty as charged as anybody else. But is that okay? For us to just pretend that everything's just going to pan out and as long as they're over there and I'm over here. In 1 John chapter 4, the Apostle John revisits this whole subject matter. He readdresses it once again. This is the third and final time that John is going to bring to our attention the importance of loving 
those in the family of God. He brought it up already in 1 John chapter 2, verses 7 through 11. And in that context, 1 John chapter 2, verses 7 through 11, John brings up the importance for us to, to love those within the family of God because it's an indicator that we are walking in the light. That's why he brings it to our attention. And then the second occurrence of brotherly love as being something that we need to exercise, he brings to our attention in chapter 3 in verses 11 through 18. Some would say, no, you can actually start before that in verse 10 all the way to verse 24. And in that context, brotherly love is used in the sense of being an evidence that we are children of God. Now, here in the, the, this next section in 1 John chapter 4, to which I'd ask you to turn right now, 1 John chapter 4, the Apostle John circles back to this very important issue of believers loving one another. We all need to grow in this area. That's true for you, that's true for me, it's true for all of us who know and love the Lord. I'd like to invite you to follow along as I read 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has beheld God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. The phrase, let us love one another, agapomen, is used three times in this passage. Three times. The first occurrence shows up in verse 7, and it's an exhortation where the apostle's getting up in our grill, he's getting up in our face, and he says, hey, you need to be about this love stuff. The second occurrence shows up in verse 11, and there it is a statement of duty our obligation. And then finally, in verse 12, he brings it up as a hypothesis. Now, maybe you're sitting there and you're thinking to yourself, Jeff, why do I have to love other Christians? Why is this a necessary thing for me to do? I mean, there are some Christians who really get under my skin. I can't stand them. If the truth were known, these are people who tick me off. Give me one good reason why I should love other Christians, especially the ones who I don't like. Just one. I just want one reason. Please, pray tell. Okay. But why stop with one? Let's take a look at three. Because that's what John gives us in this section. And so if you're taking notes this morning, let's look at the first reason why you personally, as a believer in Jesus, need to be involved in loving your brothers and sisters in Christ, even the ones you don't like. And that first reason is because showing love puts God on display. As you are involved in expressing love toward your brothers and sisters and Jesus, you help others see who God is. You point God out. You favorably draw attention to the Lord. You're basically, whether you know it or not, you're basically saying, look, that's who I represent. That's who I am. I'm trying to honor with my life by loving you. And that's because God is the source of love. Notice with me in verse 7, where it says, Love is from God. Love is from God, just as spirits are from God. Verse 1. And those who confess Jesus came in the flesh are from God. Verse 2. And the apostles were from God, verse 6. Even before that, true Christians are from
from God, verse 4, so it is that love is from God. Love finds its source, its origin, in the person of God. It originates with him. Love is so identified with God that it's one of his attributes. It's one of his distinctive traits, his characteristics. It tells us who God is in part. It's not the only attribute, it's not the only trait, but it's one of them. Notice how it brings it out over here in verse 8. But even before we look at verse 8, we've already seen in chapter 1, verse 5, that God is light. God reveals truth. He casts light upon a situation. He's the great uh, revealer of information. He is also holy as a God of light. Also, we took note that uh, God is spirit when we've been reading in the Gospel of John, John chapter 4, verse 24. But here, notice in verse 8, it succinctly says, God is love. By the way, the middle of verse 16 says the same thing, that God is love. Now keep this um, straight in your mind. Love is not God, but God is love. We need to make sure that we're not confusing the ideas. In his commentary on 1 John, Spence Jones shares these clarifying words. We must beware of watering down God is love into God is loving. Or even God of all beings is the most loving. Love is not a mere attribute of God. It is his very nature. And so when you think about God, there are people who have a twisted way of looking at him as being this grumpy old man who just has his finger pointed at humanity and can't wait to throw them into hell. That is not the God of the scriptures. God is a God of love. He doesn't want anyone to land up in hell. God is love. It's one of his characteristics. Characteristics. It's intrinsic to his very nature, to his very being. Now, while love is one of God's attributes, it goes deeper than that. Uh, the teacher's Bible commentary points out God is love means that love is such an integral part of God's being that it never is or can be absent from him. Also, because God is love, it's important to realize that mercy and goodness flow from God, just like water flows from a river or sunlight radiates from the sun. It just, it, it automatically flows from his person. He is a God that is full of love. That's his heart. He's full of goodness. And so that begs the question, if God is love, what does that look like? If we are going to equate God with love, saying that that's how God operates, how does that show up? How does that express itself? How can you know when you are showing the kind of love which will showcase God, put him on display? That's an important question to ask because we need to take this out of the theoretical and put it into the practical. We don't want there to be any confusion about this. Well, the definitive answer is not confusing. It's found in that comprehensive list that is spelled out for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting in verse 4. Love is, love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous. Love does not brag, is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own, is not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. Uh, does not rejoice in righteousness, but rejoices in the truth. You want to know what love looks like? It's right there. And in that laundry list, we discover what love is, as well as what love is not. And so, if you're questioning how much love are you communicating these days, take out the guesswork. Just go over that laundry list. That would be a wonderful assignment for you today. Before you hit your head on the pillow tonight, just... Just go over 1 Corinthians 13 and say, have I been patient with my family members today? 
Have I been arrogant? Have I been boastful? Have I been seeking my own way in my relationships with others? Have I been deferring? Has there been jealousy on my part towards someone? Just go through the list. Just go through the list. And I could almost promise you, you will be convicted. And the reason for that is nobody except for Jesus perfectly works out love in their life all the time at the highest level. And so we all can grow in this very basic area of our lives, which John the Apostle just hammers on because he wants us to get it. And sadly, so many of us don't. But again, the question comes back to us, why should I express love to Christians? I, I, know, I, I know this one particular Christian who just irritates me, gets under my skin. I can't stand her. I can't, I can't handle him. I even question if this person even knows the Lord. The individual talks the talk but doesn't walk the walk and this person just grades on my nerves. Why do I have to express love to this person? Well, we've already seen one reason because when you're expressing love to that person, uh, you are putting God on display. There's a second important reason why you personally need to be involved in loving those who are part of the family of God. And that is simply because showing love proves that we know God. It proves that we know God. Several verses bring this to our attention. Verses 7, 8, and 12. Before you uh, get um, into a plane and, and fly out to a certain destination, uh, you have to, to prove your I identity. You have to actually prove you are who you claim that you are, right? And so what you do is, uh, after you've gone through that long line that snakes around for quite a while, and uh, you notice uh, people who are kind of frustrated, they can't get their, uh, their, their ticket or whatever they're dealing with, you, you finally get up uh, to a person who looks rather official, and you have to bring out your driver's license, or your passport, or perhaps your photo ID, and you hand it over to this, uh, this officer, uh, this uh, transportation security administration agent. Sounds so official, doesn't it? And so you turn your identity over to this individual, and, and what does she do? She looks at your identification, she looks at you, she wants to make sure that there's a match. And if there is a match, then and only then do they let you through. Well, what your personal identification is, how it's reflected in terms of communicating who you are, love is supposed to be your identifying mark as a believer. What your ID, ID is to you physically, love is for you spiritually. You're giving proof. You're giving evidence. There's an attestation, substantiation, that you are a part of God's family. Love is the way that is communicated. Now, love is not the only evidence that a person knows God, but it is at least one form of evidence that God wants us to understand. That's because when a person becomes regenerated and has fellowship with God, guess what? Love will inevitably ensue. Love will be expressed if we have really become born again, born into God's family. A love is the, the supernatural, I didn't say natural, it's the supernatural expression that will be communicated. It's a given. Because God is love, Intimate association with God will automatically be expressed. There is no such thing as a Christian who doesn't love, who just goes around hating people, especially those in the family of God. That's an oxymoronic concept. There's no such entity. If you're a true believer, then love is a part of your life and it manifests itself in how you communicate to those in God's family. 
Well, notice with me here how John first brings up this issue of love positively and then negatively. Positively, John says in the second part of verse 7, everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. That's the positive side of the ledger. And then he segues to the negative part of the equation, the converse or the flip side of the coin. The one who does not love does not know God. The absence of love, especially for those in the family of God, is a proof that a person does not know the Lord. A person can go around and say whatever he or she wants, but if love is missing, if love is not being communicated, if love is not being expressed, then that person is only fooling himself or herself. By the way, the expression does not know, let's do a little bit of a deeper dive on this uh, grammatically. It's in what is known as the aorist verb tense. It means not only does not know now, but never knew God at any time. This person has never known God. There's never been a time in this person's life when that individual knew the Lord and certainly does not know the Lord at this moment. By the way, the fact of showing love proves that we know God can be seen in verse 12. If you will drop down to that verse, the second part of that verse brings this out logically with an if-then clause. If we love one another, God meno, the Greek word means stays or remains or abides or dwells with us and his love is perfected, it attains its proper maturity in us. And so our love is like the ripe fruit that is expressed, which comes from the seed of God dwelling in us. Hey, look, if God is setting up camp and he's making his home in your life, that has got to be expressed in the way of love. It's going to come out. Again, you're saying, why do I have to express this love? You don't know this turkey who's coming to my mind right now, this person who I just can't stand. Well, notice with me again over here in verse 12. The reason that is suggested is in the first part of that verse, no one has seen God at any time. You're thinking, what in the world does that have to do with love? What is he talking about here? No one has seen God at any time? In other words, God cannot be seen with the naked eye. He can't. And because that is true, even Moses could not see God face to face. Uh, he saw the backside of God through his glory. Even angels that have uh, three sets of wings. One of their wings covers their eyes at all times. Even the holy elect angels cannot look upon God. God is infinitely holy. He's a thrice holy God. Holy, 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 say the seraphim in Isaiah chapter 6. He's incredibly holy. So no man has seen God in any time. But think about this. Expressing love is a way to help God be seen, to help make him known, to help others know what God is like. It's a way to make the invisible God visible. Showing love is the visible evidence that the invisible God lives within us. That's the connection between this bringing out that no one has seen God at any time. And so, God says, since they can't see me, literally, I could make myself known visibly, even though I'm the invisible God, through their love. That's how it happens. Okay, let's get a little negative here, not because that's my intent, but, but that's because it's the authorial intent of this passage in part. Because it's important to prove that we know God by showing love, but also because failure to do so proves that a person spiritually is a liar. Hey, I'm just a Western Union boy. I'm just relaying what God's word says here. The fact that showing love proves that we know God is emphasized in verses 20 and 21, and the flip side of the coin is also true. Drop down to verse 20 and 21, if you will. It says, if someone says, I love God, and what's the word that's used there? Feels mediocre about his brother. 
hates his brother. He is a what? Liar. Strong words. Strong words, but this is what the Word of God says. If you go around hating your brother or sister in Christ, it's not just that you are lying. Your identity is one of being a liar. Strong words. He goes on to say, For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Verse 21, And this commandment we have seen, we we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. So whenever you express love, especially to those in the family of God, guess what? You're proving that you know God, that you are a part of his family, that you will one day have an eternal home waiting for you. That's what this passage is telling us. It's a concrete evidence. Again, I want you to think right now about someone maybe, God forbid, in this church who you don't like, you have not been expressing love toward recently. Don't think about the other guy. Don't think about other churches. Don't think about quacks on social media. Think about you, you and this other individual who you're at odds with right now. Why should you express love to this person? I, I, I know you're just churning in your spirit and you say, I don't want to express love. This person just makes me miffed. Here's why. Once again, a reminder. Because when you show love, you're putting God on display. You're saying, Psst, hey, look at who he is. You're taking the spotlight off of you. And also because you are proving that you are a child of the king. You're giving concrete evidence that you know the Lord. Let's look at the third and final reason why you and I need to be expressing love toward those within the family of God, and that's because showing love flows out of our relationship with God. It just automatically will will come out of our rapport with him. Once your relationship with God is in place, then love is a given. It is inevitable. It's got to be expressed. It automatically will kick in. You say, why does that happen? Well, the reason our love for others automatically flows out of our relationship with God is because God's love for us is a big motivator. Once again, we think about who God is, our relationship with him. It drives us to want to express our love for our brothers and sisters, even the unlovable even for those who we don't like, even those who get on our nerves. The greatness of God's love for us gives us an incentive to love one another. Notice how this uh, plays out in this uh, passage here, verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Now, we would expect this to read differently, wouldn't we? We would expect what this is going to say, particularly the last part of this verse, to say this. If God so loved us, we also ought to love God. But it doesn't say that. That would be easy, right? We would say to ourselves, God's lovable. I mean, look, what, look at all. He, he lavishes upon me grace upon grace. He just, he loves me so much. I am happy to love him back. But it doesn't say that. If God's loved us, we also ought to love one another. It should be obvious that because God loves us, we naturally want to love God back. That's a no-brainer. You are aware that because he first loved you, you by necessity want to love him back. He's the causal agent. He's the one who initiates love toward you, and he's easy to want to love. But those in his family... Well, that's another story, isn't it? John omits the thought of because God loves us, we ought to love one another because it by necessity follows. That's obvious. But because God loves us, he then brings to our attention the difficult part of this verse. 
Once again, there's an if-then logical flow here. If A is true, then B should automatically follow A. Now, um, you're thinking to yourself, um, let, let's help me out with this word ought. Is this some kind of a, a moral obligation here in verse 11? Uh, because if it is, I, I don't think I'm, I'm buying this. It, you're saying that, that uh, I ought to is a, is a should. I, I have to jump aboard uh, on this, this gravy train of loving other people even though I don't want to. And, and they claim that the term ought does not point out a duty. Those who, who give pushback to this as much as they say it's appropriate. They say because God has loved us to such a great degree, it makes sense that we would express love too. But that explanation is weak. That's not what he's talking about here. Uh, in his commentary, uh, Daniel Aiken has the right idea, I believe. Uh, John's use of ought, afe lamen, infers that there is an inner motivation and obligation to love others. Further, this obligation or debt cannot be postponed for any reason. It is one we rightly owe. John is insisting that loving God and loving others cannot be divorced, which is exactly what Jesus taught in Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40. John is writing to those who are recipients of God's love. Since God has loved them in this way, they have no option but to do the same. A scholar named Burdick explains the fact of God's matchless love lays upon us a continuing obligation, the Greek pre is a present tense, to be loving toward one another. Not only is it true that we have received the nature of God by reason of our new birth, and thus uh, we should love, but we have the example of his love teaching us and persuading us to love each other. Those who are children of God must show mercy because he shows mercy, Luke 6, verse 36. They must be holy since he is holy, 1 Peter 1, verse 15. They must love since he loves. That's a good word. It is an obligation. It's a moral duty. We ought to, by necessity, to love whether we feel like it or not. You know, it's easy for us to, to hear a message like this and not personalize it. It is so easy for us to say, man, I am so glad my wife is here today. Boy, does she need to hear this. Or man, I am so glad my hubby is here today. My, my hubby needs to be schooled in terms of how to, to show love because he doesn't do it so well. Go ahead and preach it, Pastor. Bring it on, Jeff. And I'm going to be praying that God just will, will, will cause him or her to hear it and to personalize it, to um, appropriate what you're, you're saying because that individual just doesn't get it. It'd be easy to not personalize what we're talking about here today and say that other person really needs this. Well, no doubt that other person does need this, but so do you. We all need this. We all need to grow. Hey, it's one thing for us to have as a motto as our church, Shepherd of the Hills, where love and joy abound. Great motto. How are we doing? How do you as a representative of the Lord and of our church family point with accuracy to that slogan, Shepherd of the Hills, where love and joy abounds. Does love flow out of your lives? Yes, others in our church or family need this, but so do you and so do I. I'd like you to think for a few moments about your life. Will you do that? Will you think about your lifestyle? Just take a moment to press the pause button right now, and I'd like for you to consider where things are at with you and the Lord, especially in terms of how you are re relating to those within the family of God. Are there recent times in your life where you can honestly say, yes, Pastor, I can honestly say that I have been showing love? 
and I have been expressing it even when it hasn't been easy. And if that's the case for you, I say may your tribe increase. Uh, may you be, as it were, like a contagion for others to follow the example of you loving unconditionally just the way God loves you and loves me. I don't need to, to school you in terms of, of how to love. God gives us ample opportunities to show love. We have ministry heads over certain areas of our church. And one of the areas where we are able to practically show love is by providing meals for those who have need. And so we have some ladies in our church family, Barbara and Linda, uh, who spearhead this ministry of meals to those who need assistance. What a beautiful way to express love. But it doesn't even need to be that difficult, especially if you're like me and you're not very good with cooking. There's such a thing as just shooting off a text, an email, picking up the phone, find a need and fill it, observe a hurt and be used by the Lord to help heal it. Look for needs, needs, they're all around you. One of the greatest ways that I endeavor as a pastor to show love is usually not even spoken about very often amongst pastors, amongst other believers, and that's by me giving you these, these two little items in my dome, my eyes. When you talk, I'm gonna give you my undivided attention. I'll never forget, I attended this one church, a mega church, and I, I'd be trying to talk uh, to uh, the pastor, and he's like looking over, over my head to see who, who is more worthy of his time. Well, that was the message that was communicated to me. And that made such an impact on me that when a person talks to me, I do everything I can possibly to give them my undivided eye contact. Because that is the way that I'm saying to you, I love you. I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna make you the center of the universe by giving you my eyes. That's a simple way that you can communicate love, isn't it? Look for needs, they're all around. Ask the Lord, God, how would you like to work through me today to be an extension of your hands, your feet, your mouth by demonstrating love to others? Need more motivation? Let me wrap it up here with these closing words from an older commentator named Matthew Henry. I like what he says here. The example of God should press us. Should, uh, we should be followers or imitators of him as his dear children. The object of the divine love should be the object of ours. Shall we refuse to love those whom the eternal God has loved? We should be admirers of his love and lovers of his love and consequently lovers of those whom he loves. The general love of God to the world should induce a universal love for all mankind. And as I've said before, there are lots of ways that we can be expressing love. But let's think as we wrap this up, how does God show us love? It, it could be that you're frustrated with God right now. Maybe you're even mad at him if the truth were known. You're struggling with the Lord. And maybe you're even grappling with the idea of just turning him off, going about your life for the rest of your life. And the question that circulates in your mind is, how has God ever shown me love? Oh. Do you really need to know the answer to that one? Romans 5, verse 8. What a delicious verse that is. Yeah, it's yummy. It's great. But God demonstrates his own love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, in other words, while we were yet polarized from him, at odds with him, at enmity, against him, doing our own thing, 
focused on ourselves, not his will. Christ died for us. At one time we were polarized, but when we embrace the Lord Jesus Christ, reconciliation kicks in immediately. When is eternal life? It doesn't begin when you die. It starts right here, right now. Jesus says, this is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. You can have eternal life now. What a great time to begin that relationship with him. And so as a result of Christ dying for you, God demonstrates his love for you. He couldn't show you to any greater degree how much he wants a relationship with you than sending his own dear son to die on a cruel cross on your behalf. And so now it's your turn. It's your turn. It's your opportunity to give your love back to him. That happens the moment you repent. Repent is not a word that is used too often in churches. It's not often used with those who want to peddle easy believism or a cheap grace. But repeatedly, especially in the book of Acts, we find the message, repent and believe in the Lord Jesus. Have a change of mind. Maybe you didn't think of it, Jesus in the past as being God in the flesh who died on the cross for your sins and was bodily raised from the dead. Maybe you didn't see yourself as a sinner. And so you need to change your mind about these things and have a willingness to turn away from your sins and to trust Christ. Repent. Turn away from sin and turn toward the Savior. If you've never come to Christ, what are you waiting for? You think things are going to get a whole lot better on this planet for you? Hmm? You think... uh, President Trump or President Biden or Kevin McCarthy or or someone else is going to save the day? Is that your hope? Really? Serious? Some political party is going to just make everything wonderful again? Come on. Get serious. Our world is in a hot mess and it's getting worse. And it's going to get even worse and worse and worse. I'm not a prophet, I'm a pastor, so I'm not into being a doomsday prophet, but doomsday is coming. It's called the tribulation, and you don't want to be here, because then it will cost you to be a believer. There'll be myriads upon myriads of believers who will lose their life. They'll have to pick between saving their own life by taking the mark of the beast. They will be chipped in their forehead or on their hand. That will be the only way that they can buy or sell. Or if they come to Christ, they may have to pay with their own lives, with martyrdom. Don't wait. And so I say to you, come to Christ. Come to him. He is the greatest solution to your greatest challenges for both time and eternity.